Well, we've come to what is in many ways a central point within the letter of 1 Timothy. And we'll have a look how everything that we've seen so far and everything that flows from this point in the letter really does pivot around this section, these three very important verses within, within the letter. I call the sermon that I've preached on this section a truth-shaped church. If you haven't yet taken the time to just read these verses for yourself, I encourage you to do that. Just stop the video, read them just a few times, try and pick up some uh, key ideas. And if you've been on this journey through 1 Timothy up to this point, try and pick up some themes that we've seen in the letter up to this point and spend some time praying. Ask God to help you to understand his truth that you might be better equipped to live in response to it. And if you are teaching it to others, uh, I really do pray that this video is helpful in that. For yourself, the most important thing is just to read, read the passage a number of times and pray and ask God to help you to understand it. Now, I say that this is a central section in the letter because of the statement that Paul makes here. I'm writing these instructions so that... He's giving us a purpose statement. If you are looking for the point of the letter, uh, here it is. He's telling us exactly why he writes. And he wants this church to know how to conduct themselves within God's household. So it's talking about conduct within uh, God's household, the church of the living God, as he calls it. So many have understood this letter to be a, a letter helping Timothy to know how to order his church well. Um, sort of put structures in place to order the church. Now, I think from what we've seen so far in the letter, as Paul starts and says that he is writing, uh, Paul the Apostle of Christ Jesus, 1 verse 1, by the command of God our Savior and Christ Jesus our hope. So we saw straight away as the letter started, salvation of sinners is at the heart of this letter. Chapter 1 verse 15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners and then 2 verse 3 which we've seen already he says God our savior wants all people to be saved so salvation is at the heart of the whole letter so when he says he wants to tell them how to conduct themselves he's telling them how to conduct themselves in such a way that the truth of their salvation will shape everything about them as the church and so this idea of truth the truth. There is truth with a capital T. Paul is wanting them uh, not only to be shaped by this truth, but to hold this truth up and for their whole lives to be uh, transformed by the truth. And when Paul speaks about truth, it is uh, his shorthand way. Uh, it's synonymous with Paul for the gospel truth, uh, the good news of salvation through Jesus for sinners. It's the truth that we see in 1 verse 15. It's the truth that we see in 2 uh, verse 3 and 4. And particularly here in 2 verse 3 and 4, where Paul says, God our Savior wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Paul wanted people to know the truth, he wanted them to live according to the truth, this truth of salvation through Jesus. And here he speaks about conducting ourselves as the church in a way that really holds up this truth. And Paul gives us a number of descriptions for uh, what the church is. He calls us God's household. He calls us the church of the living God. And he calls us the pillar and foundation of the truth. And you can spend a uh, significant time unpacking these different terms that Paul uses for the church. If you want to go and cross-reference some more of what uh, Paul says uh, about God's household, you can go and look at Ephesians 2, verse 19 to 22. He's already spoken about God's household in uh, 1 Timothy 3, verse, verse 4 and 12. And if you think about a household, if you think about your own household, it's the house that belongs to you. And here he says that as the church, we are God's household. It's the, the house, the, the family members who uh, belong to God. And if you want to know what it's like 
to be a part of God's household, the best way to do that is to go and see how the members of that household conduct themselves. So Paul wants them to conduct themselves in a way that is good and right. And in this household, shaped by this glorious truth of salvation, uh, we want Jesus to be the hero in the house. So he says, uh, within God's household, which is the church of the living God. Now, this title for God, the living God, is not a very common title for God in God's word, uh, but we do see it in uh, Joshua chapter 3. Uh, we see it in uh, 1 Samuel, the great story of David and Goliath in 1 Samuel 17. We see it in Daniel chapter 6. Um, and when we see God being spoken of as the living God, in Joshua 3, he's the God who would save the people from the nations of the lands they were going to take over. In 1 Samuel 17, he's the God who would save the Israelite army from uh, Goliath and the Philistine army. In Daniel 6, he's the God, the living God, who would save Daniel from the mouth of the lions. So when Paul speaks about the church of the living God, it is showing that he is a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. And from the beginning of 1 Timothy, we know that false teachers have come into the church. We saw that in chapter 1 verse 3. Uh, they are teaching false doctrines. And they are what Acts 20 calls the, the wolves who come in among the, the flock, not, not sparing the flock. And so these wolves have come in, but Paul says this is the church of the living God, the God who saved his people in the Old Testament. He is still a God who saves. He is a God who will protect his very precious church. So this is a massively encouraging title to be the church of the living God, the God who saves. So not only are we members of God's household, we are saved members of that household who God will protect. But then the next phrase that he builds on this, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Um, in Ephesus, they had many temples. One of the biggest and most well-known was the temple to Artemis and full of pil pillars and a firm foundation that held up this magnificent roof of this temple. But here... Paul wants them to picture that kind of picture, but it's us, the temple, who are the pillar and foundation holding up the truth. This glorious truth that God wants all people to know, the truth of salvation. We are the ones who hold this truth up for all the world to see. And so Paul says, although he hoped to come to them, he couldn't get to them, he writes them this letter so that they will know how to conduct themselves as God's church, the household of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation holding up the truth. But then he goes into this interesting poem in verse 16. And what is the, the link between verse 14, 15 and then into verse 16? Well, the way that we hold up the truth is by living godly lives. So he speaks about true godliness here. And this idea of uh, living godly lives, true godliness, is something that we already saw in chapter 2, verse 2, where he said, pray that we might live godly lives. We're going to see it in chapter 4, verse 7 to 8, in chapter 6, verse 3 to 6. Godly living is uh, an important theme in this letter. It's a letter that centers around Christ Jesus who came into the world to save sinners. But those saved sinners now need to lead godly lives because by their godly lives, they hold up this truth and show that it's actually true. Here in verse 16, he says, beyond all question, the mystery. Um, we saw uh, this idea of uh, the mystery back in the earlier verses. So in uh, 3 verse 9, uh, Paul also spoke about this mystery, and this is a mystery that's been made known. Um, it's an open mystery, the mystery as fully revealed in Christ, who's come into the world to save sinners. So the mystery refers to the whole scope of uh, the, the Bible story, 
uh, the revealed content of God's plan of salvation, which finds its climax in Jesus. And he's saying, beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs. So this mystery fuels true godliness. And then he gives us this poem, which is a summary of the mystery that he's talking about, the revealed mystery that he's talking about. And I think we can look at this poem in uh, three couplets. The first two verses are reminding us that Jesus uh, appeared in the flesh. So he came as a real man to live the life that we couldn't live. And then he died the death that we deserve to die. But then he was vindicated by the Spirit when on the third day he rose again. So the first two lines of this poem are holding up what is central to the gospel, the, the truth that we hold dear, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, that he died and was raised to life so that we might have life. And then the next two lines of this poem was seen by angels, was preached among the nations. Uh, they are speaking about what happened after Jesus rose from the dead. And if you go and read the resurrection account in Matthew's gospel, as angels spoke to the woman and said, well, he's not here, he's risen. And then they said, go and tell. Go and tell the disciples that he's not here. So it's talking about the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, he was seen by angels. He was preached among the nations. And why would this message need to be preached? Because it's truth that needs to be believed in. We want to hold this truth up, the good news about Jesus. And we want the world to believe. Because Jesus is now seated on his throne in glory, and one day he will come. And only those who have believed in him will get to join him in glory. Only those who trust that he came in the flesh, was raised by the Spirit, vindicated for our salvation, shown to be the resurrected Lord of all creation. This is the good news that's been preached and continues to be preached. And it's good news that needs to be believed in. And that's what Paul is talking about here. This is the truth that we as God's household are to hold up. This is the mystery, the mystery from which true godliness springs. The good news of the gospel, the truth of the gospel is the thing that fuels the way that we live. Our godly lives show that the truth that we hold up is indeed true. This is good news that's been preached. It is good news that has been believed on. And it's good news that needs to continue to be preached so that others will believe and they will be counted among those sinners who have now been saved by Jesus. And so we want to, as the church, conduct ourselves in a way that shows how good it is to be a part of God's household, full of saved sinners, rejoicing in the living God who saves and holding up this truth uh, that Jesus saves by the way that we live. Now, a very important takeaway point from all of this is the fact that the way we live as Christians matters. We can't just go on living our own lives, uh, being thankful for the salvation that is ours in Jesus, but not letting it change the way we live, or else our very lives won't be something that holds up this truth for the watching world to see. So we need to think very carefully about how we live. And so if you think about the verses that came before this, where Paul spoke to the overseers and the deacons and he told them these are the types of qualifications that need to be seen in your lives well it's those kind of things that need to be seen in the lives of all of God's people so that true godliness will be seen in all of God's people because those godly lives are what show that the truth that we hold up is indeed true the way we live as Christians really does matter and so as you dig into this passage further, as you think about how your life and the life of those who you are going to teach uh, holds this truth up, it should be our prayer that God would show areas of our lives in which uh, we aren't living as godly, in as godly a way as we should, and pray that the mystery of this 
gospel that has been preached to us and believed by us, that it would continue its work of transformation in our lives so that our very lives will hold this truth up for the world to see as we rejoice in the salvation that our living God has secured for us, as we live together as God's household, brothers and sisters united because of Jesus, holding up and holding out this truth that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. We can't just go on living the way we once did. Our lives need to show that the gospel shapes, the truth shapes us as God's people. The way we live as Christians matters. So let's pray that our very lives would indeed hold out this glorious truth to a watching world. And let's pray that all the glory would go to Christ, our King. Amen.